We ended the last lecture with the death of Marcellus and Crispinus. Both consular armies were now leaderless and in close proximity to the Carthaginians. The loss meant Hannibal had near total control of the south, especially in Brutium, where his army was allowed to forage at will. To maintain the momentum, Hannibal desperately needed more reinforcements. In Rome, the Senate moved to quickly nominate Claudius Nero. Livy indicates that although Nero was highly regarded for his ability, he was also thought to be, quote, too impulsive and venturesome, end quote. These were not good characteristics in the field against Hannibal. The Senate wanted to find a, quote, cool and prudent colleague, end quote. The Senate turned to Marcus Livius Salinator, quote, he had been consul several years previously, and after laying down his consulship, had been impeached before the assembly and found guilty. This disgrace he felt so keenly that he removed into the country, and for many years was a stranger to the city and to all public gatherings. It was about eight years after his condemnation that he was brought back to the city. His neglected hair and beard, his whole appearance showed pretty clearly that he had not forgotten the humiliation. The censors made him trim his hair and beard and lay aside his squalid garments and take his place in the Senate and discharge other public duties. Even then, he contented himself with a simple aye or no to the question before the House, and the senators remarked to one another that the people had wronged an innocent man, to the great detriment of the Commonwealth, which in the stress of a grievous war had been unable to avail itself of the help and consul of such a man as that, end quote. And so Marcus Livius Salinator was confirmed as the second consul. Meanwhile, disturbing news arrived that Hasdrubal had already entered Gaul and was nearing the Alps. The Romans dispatched scouts to ascertain Hasdrubal's exact location. They received information from the local Gallic tribes that Hasdrubal had not crossed the Alps yet, due to the previous winter, but would make a crossing in the spring of 207 BC. And so there was the expectation that Hasdrubal could make an appearance in Italy at any moment. When the consuls assumed their commands in 207, it was decided that they would separate their armies rather than combine their forces. One consul would be dispatched north to deal with Hasdrubal, and the other consul would be sent south to keep a close eye on Hannibal. Livy indicates that the Roman Senate assigned military tribunes for the first four legions, while the consuls commissioned the rest. The consuls were also delayed by bad omens. The pontiff and priest needed to be consulted, and the required sacrifices were performed. Once the gods had been appeased, the consuls proceeded on with their duties. Once again, there was a great amount of apprehension that Hasdrubal might make a descent at any moment from the Alps. The Senate was convinced that Hasdrubal needed to be dealt with immediately after he descended from the mountains. This would prevent Hasdrubal from starting another uprising among the Cisalpine Gauls. There was also concern Hasdrubal might cause problems in Etruria, which recently had been wavering in its loyalty to Rome. But the greatest concern to the Romans was the prospect that Hasdrubal might link up with Hannibal. Therefore, the consuls wanted to keep Hannibal occupied in Brutium to prevent this from happening. Despite these inherent threats, Consul Livius failed to move and remained in Rome. Livy indicates that the consul was not at all enthusiastic about the legions that had been assigned to him. He felt Nero had the better army. In order to put Livius' mind at ease, he was provided with more reinforcements. The Senate accomplished this by ordering Scipio, who was in Iberia, to dispatch strong reinforcements in the form of 8,000 Gauls and Iberians, along with 2,000 Roman soldiers and 1,000 cavalry. Soon news arrived that confirmed Rome's worst fears. Hasdrubal was in fact crossing the Alps, and that thousands of Gauls had joined him. The consuls now expedited their recruitment efforts and departed Rome for their assigned provinces. As mentioned before, the overall goal was to keep both Hasdrubal and Hannibal sufficiently occupied in order to prevent the Carthaginians from combining their armies. In this matter, luck was on the Roman side. Hannibal thought Hasdrubal's crossing would take much longer than it actually did. Livy indicates that Hannibal's passage had been extremely difficult, but Hasdrubal's crossing of the Alps turned out to be much easier. The Gauls were now fully acquainted with the Carthaginians and offered their assistance to Hasdrubal. They were also fully aware of the Punic War taking place in Italy and that the Carthaginians were only using the Alps to move troops into Italy in order to wage war against Rome. Also, many of the bridges and roads that Hannibal had constructed a decade earlier were still intact, 
After Hasdrubal descended out of the Alps, he laid siege to Placentia. Livia indicates this was an incredible waste of time, as he made no effort to move south and link up with Hannibal. Meanwhile, Hannibal learned of Hasdrubal's descent and immediately marched out of his winter quarters at Metapontum. Livy writes that, quote, any successes achieved in Italy and Sicily stayed the collapse of the battered republic. While the distance at which that unsuccessful war was waged in the remotest corner of the world afforded in itself a breathing space, now they had two wars in hand, both in Italy. Two generals who bore illustrious names were closing around Rome. The whole weight of the peril, the whole burden of the conflict, had settled down on one spot. The one who was first victorious would in a few days unite his forces with the other. Such were the glooming forebodings, and they were deepened by the recollections of the past year, made so mournful by the death of both consuls. In this depressed and anxious mood, the population escorted the consuls to the gates of the city, as they left for their respective provinces. End quote. Claudius Nero had assembled a large army of 40,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry which the consul intended to deploy directly against Hannibal. Hannibal assembled the whole of his force and marched towards Lucania. His main intention was to recover the towns that had previously switched their loyalties to Rome, and then to move north for a link-up with his brother. Meanwhile, Nero also marched towards Hannibal's position. The consul carefully scouted the surrounding countryside as he advanced. He then fixed his camp about a mile and a half away from Hannibal. Daily skirmishes took place between the scouting parties of both armies. Nero was anxious to keep Hannibal occupied, and Hannibal was equally determined to break loose of Nero in order to link up with his brother. During one of the skirmishes, some of Hannibal's forward troops lost all discipline, and, quote, when the consul saw them in this disorder, he ordered the military tribune of the 3rd Legion to send the cavalry attached to his legion at full gallop against the enemy. For, as he said, they were scattered over the plain like a flock of sheep, and could be ridden down and trampled underfoot before they could close their ranks. Hannibal had not left his camp when he heard the noise of the battle. He lost not a moment in leading his force against the enemy. The Roman cavalry had already created a panic amongst the foremost of their assailants. The first legion and the allied contingent on the left wing were coming into action. The enemy, in no sort of formation, were fighting with infantry and cavalry as they happened to meet them. As their reinforcements and supports came up, the fighting became more general, and Hannibal would have succeeded in getting his men into order in spite of the confusion and panic, a task almost impossible for any but veteran troops under a veteran commander, if they had not heard in their rear the shouts of the cohorts and manibals running down the hill, and saw themselves in danger of being cut off from their camp. The fact that some of Hannibal's forward troops lost all discipline in the face of the Romans is likely more reflective of all the veterans that his army had lost in the last several years. In any event, Hannibal retired to his camp for the night. The next day, the Romans offered battle, but Hannibal failed to appear. The Romans used the spare time to bury their dead from the previous engagement, and also scour the battlefield for war booty. Without adequate reinforcements, Hannibal was in no position to take on such a large force in the open field. For several more days, Nero marched out his army, but once again Hannibal failed to make an appearance. Each day the Romans carefully marched closer and closer to the Carthaginian camp, but in reality Hannibal had already secretly departed from the area days earlier. It seems Hannibal had resorted to his old tactic of leaving numerous campfires, along with standing tents to give the impression the camp was still occupied. A few detachments of Numidians were left to make a show of themselves on the rampart and at the gates. With the deception put in place, Hannibal made his way up to Apulia, where he hoped to link up with Hasdrubal, who was moving his army through Umbria. Nero finally decided to move closer to the gates of the Carthaginian camp. As the Romans made their final approach, the Numidians galloped off to rejoin Hannibal. Nero soon entered the camp, only to find it deserted. The next day, he set off in pursuit of Hannibal. We will continue on with the Second Punic War in the next video.